Hey all, you probably know this really famous story of these three little pigs and a really nasty wolf that was running around town and you know went up to this one house where one pig was living and blew real hard and knocked down the house made out of straw and then went up to a second house where the second pig was living and knocked down the stick house but then went up to the third house that was made out of bricks and wasn't so successful. Well today on Galileo's Universe we're going to explore why is it that, that tornadoes somehow strike mobile home parks? And this is all going to be about not just the tornadoes, but the construction of the mobile home parks themselves. So, tornadoes, they're one of nature's strongest forces. In fact, in some ways, they're stronger even than hurricanes that strike our coasts. Tornadoes have got wind speeds that are far in excess of hurricanes, with hurricanes mostly topping at around 150 or 175 miles an hour. Tornadoes can have wind speeds of 300 miles an hour or even more. But what is it about tornadoes that allows us to see them in the first place, and how do they form, and why do they seem to cause so much damage to trailer parks? Those are the kind of questions we're going to answer today. But before we get started with this issue of striking trailer parks, let's first take a look at how they form in the first place and where they come from. Well, it turns out that tornadoes come from a storm. You have to have a storm and you've got to have clouds. But we see them in much the same way that we see clouds. So today, we're gonna to take a look at how clouds form with a couple very simple uh, items. We've got this huge bell jar that's here. Very large jar. And then, I've got a question. What are the three ingredients that go into cloud formation? I'll let you think a second. Okay, you've thought. Well, we have to have these three special ingredients. One, of course, is air or atmosphere. If we go to the moon where there is no air, we're not going to be able to form a tornado. Our second ingredient that's required is water vapor. And then our third ingredient that we need is sort of dust or or what scientists call particulate matter. Well, we're going to add those three ingredients together in this jar. So that we can see it, I'm going to move this, and we're going to take a look at this a little bit later. Um, so inside here, we've already got our air. And then our second ingredient is going to be water vapor. So I'm going to spray a little bit of water vapor in here. Now, of course, what you just saw was not just water vapor, but it was a lot of water liquid that went in. And then finally, our third ingredient is going to be dust or particulate matter. Now, our atmosphere has lots of dust that goes into the sky. If we could somehow create a perfectly clear atmosphere, which would not be possible, but if we somehow could, water would have a very difficult time condensing in order to form clouds. This dust allows the water to condense very easily, and it's when the water condenses that allows us to see the clouds. So, we're going to add our third ingredient, the particulate matter, and it's going to come from matches. So I'm going to light a match and then put it out real quickly and then drop it in. And so you notice we've got all three ingredients in here, but we don't see the cloud. Well, there's a reason for that. We have to do something with our atmosphere. Now, where do the clouds form? They form way up in the sky. And in fact, when we go up into the sky, the air pressure is a lot less. Now, air pressure is basically the effect of gravity, which is what's keeping, it, keeping us on Earth. And it's the effect of gravity pulling down on us. If I have the size of a quarter, I'm going to put a quarter on my hand just so you can see the effect of this. On that one quarter, if I take the column of air all the way to the top of the atmosphere, that weighs 14.7 pounds. So we say that the pressure of the air is 14.7 pounds per square inch. And a square inch is about the size of that quarter. 
So we have a whole bunch of quarters that would cover our body. So we've got a tremendous amount of air pressure that's pushing on us. Now, of course, if you go and grab a bunch of bricks and put that many bricks on top of your body, you would get crushed. So our bodies have evolved over time so that we have the same amount of pressure pushing out so that we don't get crushed by our own atmosphere. So we see these clouds way up and we've got to change the pressure. We have to go from 14.7 pounds to something less. And so I can do that. I'm going to show the effect of air pressure with these two suction cups. And you can get these suction cups almost anywhere, like maybe at a car dealership. They're used to lift glass off of uh, cars. And right now, if I push them together, what I'm doing is squeezing the air out. And this is going to demonstrate how strong air pressure is. First of all, they stick together. They stick together not because of any magic, but because the outside air is pushing these together. Inside, we've got a lot less air. Outside, we have a lot more air. Inside, we say that's low pressure. Outside, high pressure. In fact, it's so strong that I can't even pull them apart. It's only if I break the seal and let the air back in that the air pushes them apart. So this change in pressure is critical. We can't see anything right now, but if I take a vacuum pump and start to take some of the air out, watch what happens. I'm going to stand aside so that you can see the effect of this. I'm going to turn on the pump and start to take the air out and almost immediately you see a cloud form inside. Now I'll take it out and you see as the air rushes back in, the cloud disappears. What's happening here is the water vapor, because of lower air pressure, is condensing onto the dust, onto that smoke that was in here. And when I take it off, the water re-evaporates. So this effect of forming a cloud and then disappearing is because the three ingredients are there, but also because I'm lowering the air pressure. So the reason we see a tornado is because we're having the water that's in the air around the storm condense to form a cloud. And in fact, you even see really great footage of these tornadoes where the air is rushing in along the ground and the water condenses right near the tornado. A tornado is an area of very low air pressure. Now, coming up, we're going to take a look at why do these things spin in one direction or the other, and then how do they cause all the damage that you see in these trailer parks? Now, before we explore more about tornadoes, let's take a closer look at the direction they spin. Now, first of all, we got to acknowledge that this spinning comes from the Coriolis effect. And many people think that the Coriolis effect also causes water to go down the drain in the counterclockwise direction in the northern hemisphere. I'm going to prove to you that this Coriolis effect doesn't work on small-scale systems like a sink. So let's take a look. All right, I've got a plunger, I've got a bowl of water here, and I'm going to just lift this up so the water will start to drain. And we're going to take a look at the effect of the water just going down the drain. All right, so we see a little bit of spin to water, not much. Now, if it turns out that it was just the rotation of the earth causing the water to spin in the counterclockwise direction, it will only spin that direction. But I'm going to prove to you with two other experiments that I can make it happen without the big effect of the earth doing this. Let's take a look. So this is counterclockwise direction. And I'm going to kick it in the counterclockwise direction. And now clockwise direction. All right, so we see from these experiments that it's me causing the water to spin in one direction or the other, not the rotation of the Earth on these large scale systems. That only occurs on much larger scales like our hurricanes, like low pressure systems, and in most cases, like tornadoes. And we're going to see that in a second, but you um, need to excuse me for a second, okay? Yes. 
All right, now that we know that the Coriolis effect is a large scale effect and not something that happens in a sink or a toilet, let's take a look at what causes tornadoes to spin the direction that they do. Now, I've got this device that I've created and all that it is is a piece of wood that's been cut round with a screen around it. The screen has a big effect on making the tornado that we're about to see and we're able to spin it. Now, this is a demonstration you do not try at home. And the reason is you do not try it at home is because it involves fire. So we really don't want all these neighborhoods to go up in flames because you're creating these cute tornadoes. All right, what I've got in the bottom is a, a rag that has put, I've put some uh, flammable material on it. I'm not going to tell you what it is, it's just flammable. And we're going to go ahead and light this up and we're going to see what happens to the tornado that's created. Yes, we're creating a fire tornado. And even though this is a tornado that we create here, even in firestorms that are often found out in the West, they also will have these fire tornadoes that will spin up from the, the winds that occur around the fires. So I'm going to go ahead and light this. And one of the things that you're going to see is that it catches on fire. Hmm, okay, but you notice that the flame is not all that great. Now, as in a real tornado, in the northern hemisphere, most of them spin in the counterclockwise direction. So I'm going to slowly start to spin this. And as I spin it, you see that it starts to create a tornado. Now, this tornado is occurring from the air that's around it moving in toward it and then up from the heat. So this is simulating a fire tornado in the northern hemisphere. Now I'm going to slow this down and you notice that as the rotation stops so does the flame. The flame dramatically reduces. Now let's say we go to the southern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, most of the tornadoes move in a clockwise direction. So I'm going to spin it this way and you'll see that the tornado, the flame, starts to move in the opposite direction. Again, it's being fed by the air that's moving in. The screen on the outside is causing the air to move in, spin in this direction, and then rise up to create this dramatic tornado. All right. But this is from the Coriolis effect that I've artificially created. Just as the Earth spins and creates large scale rotating systems such as hurricanes, and I'm going to put this out, I also get the same thing from tornadoes. But it turns out that not all tornadoes rotate one direction or the other. In the northern hemisphere, about two thirds of the tornadoes rotate in a counterclockwise direction. About one third do not. And Scientists really don't understand why that occurs, but we do know that the big difference is between tornadoes and hurricanes is that the tornado is inheriting, it's picking up its spin from the larger storm that it's in. A hurricane rotates just because of the Coriolis effect. This more simulates the damage that's in a trailer park. This faster moving air across the top causes the higher air pressure. All right, now that we've seen how tornadoes form and the direction they spin, let's answer this whole question of why did the tornadoes strike the trailer parks? So we've got a little simulated uh, trailer park versus oh, another house here. And uh, you notice that the construction between the two is pretty different. Now, I got these houses from uh, Dr. Phillips High School in Orlando, and they create these hurricane houses so that they can attest the effects of hurricanes. Well, you know, it's the same thing, hurricane tornado, almost in this regard, because we're going to take a look at construction quality. So this one is made out of... Uh, Something like our first two uh, very unfortunate pigs, either straw or uh, sticks. So, you know, very lightweight material that's here. And then our second one over here is made out of bricks. All right, so they're Lego bricks, but a little bit heavier. So we're going to take a look at the effect of this. Now, one thing we want to consider, we're going to simulate the effect of a tornado as it comes real close. A couple things to consider. First of all, 
I'm going to be the person holding a leaf blower because we got to create a lot of wind to really have a good simulated effect on these two houses. But I'm not the tornado. I am not the tornado. The wind from a tornado always goes toward the tornado. Many people think that if I'm standing there looking at a tornado, that the winds are hitting me in the face. Actually, what would happen is I would have stuff hitting you in the back of the head. Now, that's one of the reasons you don't want to be out in a tornado, because the debris that gets picked up by a tornado from the winds can be so high that scientists have found straw and sticks that have been embedded in trees. The wind speeds can be so high that something that's as flimsy as a, as a piece of straw can go right through a tree. The second thing is the wind always goes toward because of the effect of pressure. The tornado is a center of very, very low pressure. Remember, just like our suction cups, when I squeeze these together, I'm creating inside low pressure. Outside is relative high pressure. The suction cups stay together because the suction cups are in the way of the high and the low pressure. So the air right now is trying to get on the inside. So this is sort of simulating in a, in a small way a tornado. And when I peel this open, then the air rushes in. So the air is going to rush toward the tornado. So I've sort of placed out here in the distance our uh, fire tornado apparatus just to sort of help remind you that the air is going to be moving toward the tornado. All right? So let's watch what happens. I'm going to go ahead and grab the leaf blower and I'm going to stand a little ways away and we're going to then watch the effect on the winds from these two houses. So here we go. Okay, so we see that there's a pretty, pretty dramatic difference between the two. Let's go pick up both and take a look at the effect on the tornado on both structures. So we see that there was a pretty large difference between the two. First of all, our little friend here went flying and tumbling. So this more simulates the damage that's in a trailer park because first of all, it wasn't attached to the ground. It went flying and it went tumbling. Very lightweight structure and very lightweight material are more affected by these higher winds from a tornado. So while our friend stayed attached, imagine if you were inside of this, you would go flying and tumbling with it. So, and also remember that in real life, that if this were a, a mobile home, it would also sustain a lot of damage as it goes flying. However, let's at, look at our, uh, our second structure here. So the one that was made out of brick actually survived pretty well. It didn't go sliding. It was attached to the foundation. And also, it did receive a little damage though, and it received damage from the roof lifting off a little bit. Now this is the same kind of effect that it can occur in a real tornado that gets close but is not a direct hit. First of all, the winds can come up over the top of this and this can act like a wing. We actually get from the higher moving winds across the top, low air pressure. Now remember from the demonstration earlier that